Welcome to Gray Story Podcast. We're here to connect you with education, resources, and community that equip you for the journey of restoration. My name is Nate Davison, and I am your host here at Gray Story Podcast. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Uh, if you're listening over on Apple Podcasts, there on that app, give us a follow, tap a five star rating, and drop a review. If you're listening on Spotify, give us a follow there. Hit that uh, notification bell uh, to never miss an episode. Today, we've got something truly special in store for you, a conversation uh, certainly going a little deeper into the heart of faith and mental health, uh, two things very close to my own heart, obviously. Um, As we're going through life, the human experience, um, there are struggles often tucked away in the corners of our minds, uh, just waiting for someone uh, to uh, or something we read uh, to shed some light on them. Um, and one of those struggles is scrupulosity. We've talked about that on the podcast. Um, it's a form of OCD that's tightly intertwined with your religious beliefs, your moral beliefs. Um, and it's a topic, um, again, we've talked about it, but in the general public, I don't know that it's discussed openly. Um, but today we're we're just diving right in on it. Uh, so I'm thrilled to introduce our guest. It's Deborah Peck. She's the author of The Hijacked Conscience, an informed and compassionate response to religious scrupulosity. Uh, and, and I would say her book is not just an exercise in clinical exploration or something like that. It's it's a journey. It's a, a testament to resilience in the human spirit. And, and it's a lot of Deborah's own experiences woven in there into the pages. Um, so with, with that, Deborah, welcome to Grace Story Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's good to have you. And uh, so what a, what a topic to write on, first of all, but what a, what a topic to live out. Um, and I think before we jump into kind of your story, I know we'll get into it. And I'm thrilled uh, to have not just be talking about scrupulosity, uh, and if people are wondering what that is, go back to our episodes on it and listen in. We'll talk a little bit more about it here, of course, uh, but listen to those to get a good basis. But to actually have a story, um, something where people can like connect with that story. So before we jump into your book and you know how it's written, all those good things uh, and more of your story, what's your background? What what uh, if Deborah Peck was if we're meeting you for the first time? Uh, where do we go first to kind of understand where you're coming from? Well, primarily, you would start with where I was born and grew up, and that is in Idaho. So um, I'm the youngest of eight children, and uh, in a little tiny town in Idaho, and grew up there, um, grew up in the church from probably two weeks old. That's how they did it back then. (laughs) And um, as a very young child, um, I attended a, a very conservative Holiness Church, and um, my family did as well. But when I was about five years old, um, my family, my mom and the three youngest of us siblings um, actually changed churches and started attending the Nazarene Church. Um, and most of my other siblings and my all my dad's relatives stayed with the Conservative Holiness Church. And that caused a real rift in the family. But um, just before we switched churches, when I was four years old, I gave my heart to Jesus and loved, loved, loved Jesus. Um, Just that warm, wonderfulness of that relationship with God, even as a very young child, was there. And then when we switched churches, um, my my dad's family started telling us kids that we were going to hell because we were uh, not following the standards, the outward standards of the conservative holiness church. Like the women wore only dresses, um, didn't cut their hair, didn't wear jewelry of any kind, um, and the list goes on. And our family did not follow those. And so they started with me as a five-year-old telling me I was going to hell. And that was really confusing to me because I knew I loved Jesus. I knew I had given my heart to Jesus. And, um, but they kept saying, well, no, you, you aren't a Christian because you wear pants and you cut your hair. Well, I was five. I didn't have a whole lot of 
you know, choices over that sort of thing. But then when I was nine, a, a, a very significant thing happened. Um, we went to, this was back in the day when they had tent revivals. <laughs> and um, we had a little tent revival there in our small town uh, with the Conservative Holiness Church. And I went. And as I'm sitting there, I began to think, well, well, maybe I didn't ask God to forgive me appropriately. Maybe I didn't say the right prayer or maybe I wasn't sincere enough. And so at the end of the service, I went forward to pray again, what, you know, one of the hundreds of times I went to the altar. And um, I was kneeling there praying and one of my relatives came up to me and started praying with me. She's like, Debbie, tell God you'll quit wearing pants. Tell God you'll quit cutting your hair. Tell God you'll quit watching TV. And at nine years old, I remember kneeling there, devastated, just knowing inside of me, I will never, ever measure up. I will never be good enough for God. I can never do enough to earn God's love and forgiveness. And that was a very significant moment in my life that set the stage for developing scrupulosity. Well, well, let's, let's be very clear there because it, uh, going to a Nazarene church, uh, I understand that they still, um, they still hold to those top tier doctrines of, you know, being saved by grace through faith, all those, uh, you mm-hmm. know, the, they believe in the Trinity. They believe in, um, you know, salvation, uh, it, like all those things that are very, very, the key doctrines, to right. to the faith, uh, they are all there, but it sounds like what you're saying is there were those that, as you left, um, as you left the circles you grew up in, and you moved to this church, the outward appearance became the 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 thermometer of your your current heart condition. Uh, so, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, with not the, in the Nazarene Church, of course. Yeah, um, the Nazarene Church did not hold to those at that point in time. They, um, but there was a lot of animosity between the the Nazarene Church and the uh, the. Sorry, the I do not name the Conservative Holiness Church because there are those who are still in and and being helped by it. Absolutely, but w- w- there were. There was animosity between the Nazarene Church and the other conservative Holiness Church because so many members had left mm. the Nazarene Church to form this other group. That um, so, as a kid, I didn't get the support from the Nazarene Church even because of of how it interacted with the other conservative Holiness Church. So, uh, and because of all of my family, or the, most of my family, was still part of the other church we still attended their services and that kind of stuff. And that's where, you know, I kind of got caught in the middle. Well, that has to be difficult to be kind of in between groups where your ties are very strong to one group um, that holds to, uh, it sounds like a little bit of, and I don't think they would say it outright, but salvation, at least represented by your standards, uh, your careful living, if you will. Um, and another group that kind of uh, you you may be uh, lumped in with the other group is kind of like mm-hmm. who who are you just yet? Uh, yes. How did how did that how did that make you feel moving between groups? Because I'm sure you also had interactions uh, with the with both groups, um, and you're you're kind of going between the two. And as a woman, uh, the outward standards are are very very clear. Um, how did that make you feel? It was a really tough thing because, again, I was, you know, five, starting at five and then up through nine and all of that. I felt I, I didn't have a lot of control over what I wore. My dad cut my hair. Um, and, you know, it, when I was with people from the conservative holiness church, they would tell me that I was going to hell and that my mom was leading us to hell, which put a real strain on my relationship with my mom. My dad was not attending church at all at that point. So, but it put a real strain on my relationship with my parents leading to a, a, a serious distrust of them. And then, but when I was with my Nazarene friends, they would mock and make fun of the standards of the other church and say, you know, that's so not necessary and, and all of that. And as a child, I am a natural people pleaser. I'm just personality wise. I am 
compliant and um, just a, a people pleaser. And so I felt like nothing, nobody was pleased with me at all. And by extension, then God was not pleased with me. And I, I couldn't, I didn't know how to please God. And it was, it was terrible. So after that time at the altar, when I was nine, I started going back and forth between the church. I would try and follow all the rules of the conservative holiness church for a while. But then, you know, my dad would mock me and say, you've been brainwashed. And, and the Nazarene friends would say, you know, you're, that's ridiculous. And so then I would go back to not following all those standards. And then the, the other church would say, well, you're just going to hell and, and all of this. And so at, at about 11, I decided I was going to prove to God that I really was serious about this, that I was serious about my relationship with him. So I started doing things in a very rigid sort of way. Like, you know, you're taught from childhood, you need to read your Bible and pray. So I thought, well, I, I will do this right. So I would start to read the Bible in a very <laughs> religious way and pray in a very set sort of way in, in an effort to try to prove to God, I really am serious about this. Well, of course, that's that led more or less toward a scrupulosity kind of rigidness that turned in eventually to full-blown full scrupulosity. Well, I, I, listening to you, first of all, it's it's a very interesting um, observation that because I think some people can put an undue burden on, um, so, uh, and I don't know if that's the right phrase there, but on groups that that one leaves that are a little bit more strict because there is there is value in um, the way people want to live a careful life if that's how you want to live, yes. absolutely. Um, and, and if you have a conviction to abstain from something or a certain type of way you want to live your life and you feel that that is from God, I will be the first to support you. Um, Absolutely. You know, and I may not have that same conviction, but we're, we are all a part of the body of Christ and I want to support you in your walk because we're going to be spending eternity together if I read my Bible correctly. <laughs> so uh, let's support each other here. Um, and, and, but the observation that was interesting to me is you're getting that from you're getting that from both sides both where it's sides. like you're being yes. too much. Now uh, you're in our circles, be like us. And then you're, when you're over here, like, Oh, with family, uh, man, that's difficult to vacillate between the two things. And I can imagine that contributed, but then also I hear reading your Bible and praying every day. That's, that's a complete Wesleyan Arminian means of grace. <laughs> that's fit. Uh -huh. that's, that's fantastic. What are you talking about? Um, how could that be wrong? Uh, I got that'd be bad. Um, so, but, but so let's dig there. How, how did that kind of turn? Cause you mentioned it. How did that mm -hmm. turn into this scrupulosity, this scrupulous behavior that, um, that, how did that happen? Well, Bible reading specifically became a really difficult thing for me because, you know, I'd be, I had it in my mind, of course, that I needed to read the Bible through. Uh, and so I would start reading the Bible through and I'd get over to like numbers and start reading all those names. And I'm like, so-and-so did so-and-so and whatever. And I'd be like, oh no, I think I missed a word. And so I would go back and I've got to make sure I read every word. So I went back and would read every word again. Oh no, I think I might've missed it. And so I would read the same verse over and over and over to make sure that I had read every, every word of it. Because if I don't, then, oh, am I being disrespectful to God? What if it's Satan trying to confuse me and not let me read the truth and, and be able to obey God? Or, well, maybe I'm not even a Christian if I'm skipping words, you know, that sort of thing. And that the same sort of thing can happen with prayer. You know, if I, if I, so for a while, I went through this thing where I had to do the order of the letters, acts, adoration, confession, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. It's a great way to pray. But if I was just going through my day and all of a sudden I threw a, a prayer up to God, I'm like, oh, no, I didn't do adoration first. So I can't I can't go to asking God for something when I haven't done adoration and confession and thanksgiving first. 
And so, it, you know, it started to form me in ways that said, I, I can't access any of this unless I do it in the proper order. Mm. And if I don't, well, what does that say about me? Maybe I'm not really a Christian if I'm not doing it. And maybe I'm being flippant or, or maybe I'm carnal, you mm. know, or whatever the, the voices that were there were saying. And um, it, it became a burden that the very things that in your faith are are supposed to bring you life and joy, that communion with God became instead anxiety-ridden and guilt-ridden. And um, yeah, yeah, it was really tough. And as a young preteen and into my teachers, I had no, no clue. Well, again, I was only diagnosed with scrupulosity about nine years ago in my 40s. So I went most of my life from 11 until 49 or so, not knowing I had scrupulosity. Well, a, a personal note in there, because I, I resonate with what you're saying. We, uh, and, and talking in the pre-show, you and I have some similar, some similar background stories. Um, right. But yeah, it, it, it dawned on me, you know, I, when people are like, I read the Bible through, I read the Bible through, I've never said that. And it's not because I haven't read and even now I'm like read most of the Bible <laughs> through it's because I'm like you know I'm not entirely sure because I didn't sit down and read it all uh, yeah, yeah. but I might have missed a chapter and I am not going to say that I read the whole Bible when I'm not entirely sure that I read the mm-hmm. whole Bible but I, <laughs> welcome to my world <laughs> so, but but that's where also uh, I, I love the top tier doctrines uh, that we all in the body of Christ uh, uh, look to, uh, and what one of the one of the the doctrines of the Wesleyan Arminianism is that prevenient grace, which I, yes. I love so much. Um, it it helps mm-hmm. out so much um, with just the the thought that grace um, it goes before it, it precedes uh, our human decisions. Right. Uh, man, that's fantastic! Uh, if if God's grace enables um, fallen man to engage, uh, and their will to choose salvation because I also believe in free will. Um, man, yes. that's, that's so like God already thought of that and his heart goes yes. out to us, not just with pity. His eye isn't just on us, but his heart goes out to us. Uh, he, I can, I can just, even then though, it's kind of hard to, to rest in that at times. Um, so yeah. at, back, back to you though. <laughs> <laughs> as as you're going through this and you're 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 moving into kind of more of a scrupulosity you mentioned age 11 um yes and up what what does life for deborah look like and especially i i would i would ask your you know spiritual life but um also just life in general how did this bleed out into your everyday living so in a in every it affected every different thing. So I think um, one of the things that comes to mind is is socially. Um, I became I developed severe social anxiety as a result of it because I was anytime I had a conversation I would go back in my mind and go over it and over it to say oh did I exaggerate anywhere is there anything I need to go back and apologize for it, it, was I totally truthful and you know those kind of things so. A lot of ruminating and just going over in my mind every conversation that I had. So I, it just became easier not to have conversations. And so I, you know, in pra- very practical ways, I became unable to use my telephone. You know, my husband, as af- after I got married, my husband would make all the phone calls for me. I developed severe agoraphobia, where I could not leave my house by myself. Um, I could only leave it if I was with my husband. Because the social, well, part of it was social, but part of it was the fear of dying became so overwhelming. I think when I was about 16, I was on my way to church and on a Sunday morning, well, in one of the things that I was raised with is you can't read anything secular on Sunday, on the Sabbath, as they say. And so I, and I share this in my book as well, I was on my way to church and I look out the window and there's, I read a McDonald's sign and I'm terrified inside because what if I get in a car accident and die before I can ask God to forgive me for reading something secular 
on the Sabbath. And so, you know, plugging things into outlets, I was terrified I was going to I became terrified of everything that I, I was going to die. And at one point, I literally could not leave my couch without my husband being home. Even say something as personal as going to the restroom by myself, I could not do because I was so terrified of moving that I was I was just going to die. So um, as a teenager, it was more just the mental gymnastics that I did of, you know, making sure that I prayed right and read right. And um, I talk about, you know, some of the Old Testament laws of of cleanliness that I would have to do before I could pray, you know, and, but a lot of it as a teenager and young adult was very much mental, just inside. Nobody would have known looking at me that I was struggling um, because it, I was afraid to tell anyone because I thought they would, well, and the few pastors and religious people that I did tell would tell me things like, well, you're just not really submitting to God. You're not really giving yourself to God. You're carnal. You must be have some secret sin that you're holding on to. And so mostly I just learned to struggle inside by myself. Yeah. So first of all, that sounds exhausting. Um, very, it sounds very like you're exhausting. continually, and, and, and I, I understand those, uh, there are those that would listen in and uh, would kind of, here we go with the Freudian stuff, but there, uh, there's very real uh, effects to the body of being in that fight, flight, fear, yes. that all, right. not being able to switch your, your systems. Um, and, and there's very real effects to that. But, but and with, with, the, uh, with the risk of being uh, dysregulating to you, I, I also hear voices that may say, well, what she's talking about is just conviction. That's the, yeah. that's the yes. Lord convicting <laughs> your heart on those things. Um, so you need to sell out, get sold out. Right. And that would solve the problem. You're under conviction. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that as someone who's now, uh, you know, in your restoration journey from this. Because there's those listen, there's there are those that are listening mm-hmm. in. I know they are. I have faces in my head. They're listening in. And they are resonating with what you're saying. I mean, goodness, I, yes. I resonated with a part of it. You know, I, <laughs> I understand. And then there are those that really do understand. And when I just said that, they uh, a conversation comes up in their mind. Or they're like, yeah, I've heard that. That's conviction. Um, mm-hmm. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? That your anxiety, your uh, bent toward being overzealous, uh, or we'll just say zealous uh, for sake of argument, mm-hmm. zealous in these things. Um, is just conviction, um, and you should be leaning into that. So that was a huge one for me for a long time because that's what I was told, is that this is conviction. Well, and plus, one of the, from a young child, one of the things that was taught was that you the only way that God will hear a prayer of a sinner is, is a prayer of repentance. Mm. So if you're sitting in a church service and you are experiencing God's presence, I was told that is conviction because you're not a Christian. So if you're feeling anything, it's conviction. So I actually came to equate God's presence only as conviction. And that was a really devastating thing to happen in my life because literally the only, every time I felt God's presence, I thought it was conviction. And so if if that's the case, then you can never, it, it, I thought I was saved as a young child. So when I thought, well, why am I feeling conviction if I'm already saved? It was totally horrible. And being told that, well, you are feeling, if you're feeling that, um, then it's conviction. One of, one of the stories I share in my book is, so at, at when I was in college, my boyfriend at the time, he hadn't an aunt who had died very young in a tragic car accident, but they're like, she was so spiritual. And one of the ways they knew she was spiritual is she didn't tease or back comb her hair. And I mean, literally that's how, what they said is that's how they knew she was spiritual because she had thin hair and she wouldn't back comb it because that was pride. And so as I, my hair started thinning very young 
And so I started backcombing my hair. Well, for 35 years, every morning I had the conversation in my head of why it wasn't sin to backcomb my hair. As if God cares about backcombing my hair, you know, but so I had to fight those internal things. And I knew people would say, well, what you're feeling is conviction. Well, no, it wasn't conviction. It was mental illness. It was the scrupulosity demanding something of me that God was not demanding of me. And it was really hard through those times to, to try and discern what is God. It, in my early 20s, I, I came to the point where I'm like, okay, God, I truly don't know what you require of me. So I am going to start my relationship with you over as if I've never heard of you before, as if I've never had a relationship with you before. And I'm just going to start right here. And you're going to have to show me, clearly show me at every step what it is you want from me. And so I'm going to live. I'm going to pick a way to live. And then if I do something, you're going to have to show me. And to just be, and there were times I'd be like, oh, you know, is, is cutting my hair wrong? And, and my relatives would be in my head and but I would clearly hear God say, are you going to follow me or are you going to follow so-and-so? Are you going to follow me or are you going to follow the church? So not, not that there's anything wrong with church. I love, I am, I love my church. Yes. I am fully committed to corporate worship and all of that, but I had to primarily learn to follow God. And it was really difficult, but God has been faithful. That's the thing. We were taught, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? And that verse was used to say, you can't trust yourself. Well, in saying that we were taught not to trust the Holy Spirit either, that only the church can tell us what to do and how to live because you can't trust what's going on in your mind. And having the opportunity to learn to trust the Holy Spirit it, it was a journey and it was hard, hard work, but so worth it to find that peace finally. Yeah, it, it's a it's a big, big, big red flag for any organization, group, uh, or otherwise when they verbalize or insinuate that the spirit of discernment is only available to a select couple in the group. Right. Um, that's yes. a huge red flag. Uh, it, it and I, I picked up on something else as as I'm listening to you because I know there's those that man you have the one side saying what you're going through that's a that's a conviction you need to lean in and 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 uh, you know uh, it, yeah full full relationship is there if you'll just uh, sell out um, mm-hmm. and then there's others that are that are maybe saying to you well you know it clearly says that anxiety is a sin. <laughs> and you're experiencing anxiety. And it seems like that may be an especially, um, I'll call it well-intended, but certainly especially mm-hmm. damaging um, thing to say to someone who has their anxiety because they think they have sin that they don't necessarily know about and they want to make sure they're doing all that God has. So then if anxiety is the sin, then that's the sin, but it might be about another sin and I'm anxious about that. I'm never going to do this. I give up. Like yeah. how, how did, first of all, did you ever hear anything like that? And second, what was that? What was that? What would that be like uh, for someone with scrupulosity to just simply hear anxiety is a sin. Stop it. Uh, yeah. I have your heard cares. it many times. <laughs> well, yeah, throw, throw all your, I mean, and, and it's not simple. Throw all your cares on Jesus. Lean in mm-hmm. on that too. And that sounds great. Um, and I want to do that. Um, so what, what does that look like for you? Yeah, I heard many times of how my anxiety was a sin and that I was not trusting God. That was the big thing that was told me is you just don't have faith. You're not trusting God. And as I have come to understand mental health and the research on the brain, anxiety related to mental health is not the same as anxiety that's refusing to trust God. Um, OCD is an anxiety disorder and it is very guilt-inducing 
and shame inducing to hear, well, if you, if you would just trust God, you wouldn't have this anxiety and that your anxiety is a sin. Um, the Bible does say to trust in God and to cast your cares on him, that he cares for you. And those are very true. But I think there does have to be dif a differentiation between anxiety that is related to mental health. Because um, the more research they do on OCD, the more they find that it, it's a, a mix up in the brain, that the brain gets stuck. And I was just reading some of the latest research recently that was talking about, so our brains have two parts. One is, is the part that identifies incorrectness or mistakes. And uh, there's a part that puts the brakes on your behavior as a result of that. So, um, but they have found that with OCD, the brake part doesn't work. Uh, so say for instance, the reading the Bible that I, that I talk about. So my, I know that I don't need to read that verse 15 times to make sure I get every word. Part of my brain knows that, but the break part that says I will stop that behavior is broken. So I have to actually learn and reattach that part of my brain that puts the brakes on that sort of behavior to stop. And here I am not talking about sinful behavior. Mm, thank you. Um, Good. That is a, a different thing altogether. Sin is sin. And there's no excuse, so to speak, for sin. But for things, you know, like I, I in my book, I use um, picking a, a can of green beans at the grocery store. That was impossible for me at one point. I could not pick a can of, of green beans because my brain said, I have to, there's only one right can of green beans to pick, you know, and if I'm a good Christian, then I will pick the right can of green beans. <laughs> it, I mean, it sounds silly, but it, it became that severe. And it, it's the anxiety of, well, it, it, am I a bad Christian if I pick the wrong can of green beans or, or whatever the choice, I became unable to make even the simplest choices um, became nearly impossible. And the anxiety, it, it, it's just terrible. And to have the guilt placed on the person suffering for their suffering is hard. Like depression is another one. I, I suffered depression for most of my life, starting as a young child, even before the scrupulosity. And to be told, if you just have faith, you wouldn't be depressed. If you would really trust God, you would not be depressed. Well, it's not quite that simple. And to, to place that guilt on the person it is really harsh. And, and one other side of that, so for many people that, that come from my sort of background and who, who have scrupulosity or who, who just struggle in their relationship with God because they're like, I, I can never please God, God is unpleasable. There are many people who feel like God is waiting over them with a hammer to, to knock them down if they sin. For me, that was not my experience. And I have found that for a lot of people with scrupulosity, that is not how we view God. We, we actually have the ability to view God as very loving and very just. The whole problem is me. If there's a problem, it's totally me. Like the, you know, people like to say this, well, if you're feeling far from God, who moved? God didn't move. So of course it's that say you move. And you know, it's just kind of a ridiculous thing to say, but it's one of the things that I heard over and over. And but in my relationship with God, I saw God as loving. I knew God was loving and just. So if if I was afraid of going to hell, then the problem was me. I I just was evil. And so that's where a lot of people with scrupulosity internalize everything. We are evil. We are bad. We don't have faith. We have anxiety. We, and, and the list goes on and on. And um it it's just devastating. Well, it, it reminds me of the example in in one of our episodes where the the licensed counselor talked about um, being able to take things that are people saying up to and including ministers and and imagine there's a bowl in front of you and you take what they're saying and you put it in the bowl as it's being said to you mm -hmm. 
and you can consider it and take things out and look at it and oh, okay maybe i'll put that in the reconsider bowl over here and maybe this is the one i talk to people about later but the concept is all of that is still out here and not something that as someone saying you know who moved uh you and just internalize it you'd bring it in yes there's no yes. boundary there of i can i mean this is this is not just a person speaking behind a sacred desk. This is literally God himself talking to me, internalizing. Mm -hmm. Was there was there a time when that switched for you? Or was there a concept around like similar to that that helped uh, you? Because I, cause I, I also hear there's people that want to help and they're saying, okay, yeah, let's think of the prodigal son. Uh, you know, he made one move. And, and the father came running to him. Well, in your case, that's that's not very helpful because you're like, yeah, I believe the father's running towards me. He's already there. It's me mm -hmm. that can't accept it. I'm the problem. Yeah. Uh, not to quote the poet, uh, you know, uh, the songwriter, me, I'm the problem, it's me. Um, some will get that. But yeah, like if it's, that's not helpful. Um, so what was actually helpful to get through the scrupulosity for you? And some of that may be in your book here. Um, what, yes. what was eventually helpful for you? Well, first of all, was finding out I had scrupulosity. That helped tremendously because then I could, I had a category where I could realize that is not God speaking. Well, let me back up. So I was raised very much that if if a pastor said it, it was about the same as God saying it. You know, so trusting religious authority that was just what we did. We didn't, if they said it, then we better take it seriously, no matter how abusive it was at times. And it was abusive at times. We still had to take it because that, that could be God speaking. And so up until about nine years ago, you know, I, I learned ways of, of dealing with it because I had other OCD issues as well. So I went through a lot of counseling dealing with the OCD like the germ sort of OCD and locking doors kind of OCD kind of thing. So I learned how to live with the uncomfortable, as I call it, um, that, you know, to let go of certainty. In my book, I, I have a one of my chapters is the idol of certainty, you know, letting go of that idol of certainty. Yeah. And um, that, that was a, a huge one. That's a, that's a, <laughs> That's a hot seat issue right there. Uh, yeah, goodness. Because, uh, I mean, there's there's those that, because, uh, I mean, not even the some of the circles you grew up in, but, uh, well, that, that's a whole nother episode. We'll do a whole nother <laughs> episode. Yes, that, that is one. a whole, that's why it has its own chapter in my book is because it's a huge one. And, and learning that doubt is not the opposite of faith. That unfaith is the opposite of faith. You cannot have faith. If there is not room for doubt, hmm. because you, the faith isn't required unless there is a possibility that it could be true, you know, otherwise it's, I mean, if it's total certainty, then you just, there's no need for faith. And so that was a huge one for me as well. Just learning that doubts are not the enemy. Uncertainty is not the enemy but learning to trust God through the uncertainty and saying my, my ability to have a relationship with God is not based in my faithfulness. And that's a hard one for those of us that were raised, you know, that, well, you've got to get everything right or you're not going to have a relationship with God. No, my certainty is based in God's faithfulness, not in mine. And, uh, I talk in my book about, you know, I was raised that Jesus lives in our heart, which is the Bible does talk about Christ in us, you know. But for me, that was not a helpful metaphor because if God is in me, it's it's all up to me to to make sure he can stay there and to make sure I do everything right. Well, there's another part of a scripture that talks about being in Christ, and for me, that just, when I started leaning into that and embracing being in Christ, it, it wasn't about me anymore. It was about Christ's faithfulness. And I was in Christ, which made it so much bigger 
than this little person trying to hold on to God. It was God holding on to me and um, that I could trust him even with the uncertainties, even with the doubts, even with the, when I, when my mind is telling me that I'm not saved or I'm not right with God, I don't have to come back to, well, have I done everything I need to do? I come back to God's faithfulness to me. And that doesn't mean I'm free to sin at all. That I would never, because that's not true. But my not sinning is tied to God's faithfulness to me and living out of the love that I have for God and his love for me, as opposed to this thing that I have to do. I am being instead of doing. Mm. And the doing comes from my being, not the other way around. I, I grew up thinking of my doing was my being. And to let go and say, no, my being, I am, I am in Christ first, and then everything flows out of that, mm. has calmed so many of those anxiety ridden things where I just, I just come back to God. I don't have to come back to me, which scrupulosity comes back to me over and over and over. Am I doing it right? Am I getting it right? Am I believing right? Am I doing this right? Instead saying my, my eternal salvation is based in the faithfulness of Christ and he flows through me and helps me to live out my faith for him. Man, you get the in Christ alone, my faith is found. I mean, that, yes, <laughs> there's there's some <laughs> sprinklings of that throughout our theology, of course, because it's true. Uh, and, and on your concept of, of doubt, um, it there, there was uh, uh, there's a book that I love by uh, Tiffany Yecky Brooks, and she says uh, doubt requires bravery because it's it's admitting that there is a chance that you uh, that you could be wrong. Um, yes, and that's unsettling. Um, <laughs> that requires a little bit more trust on the Holy Spirit. Um, yes, and, it does. And a phrase, a phrase that I grew up with, uh, that, that comes to mind here as well is always be living you and I heard it over and over, always be living your life from the judgment seat back. Mm-hmm. Always live your life from the judgment seat back. Um, and there's, there's a concept recently, and I know, you know, at the age of 36, this should have been a lot sooner, but hey, it's where I'm at, <laughs> um, of, of living my life not from, uh, for, like, you know, trying to move towards my identity in Christ, but living my life out of my identity in Christ. Yes. Which, I, that, that seems so simple, uh, but to me, it's not, it's not. Because mm-hmm. I am working towards my identity in Christ. I'm not there yet. I don't always feel like I mean, but instead, you know, when we have gone through the thing, the repentance, turning away from sin, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. genuine remorse, and a change in direction uh, by grace right. through faith, I want to put all those caveats in it for, you know, the detractors that may be listening. I am in a relationship with Christ and we, I, I am, I am in this family of God, and now I am on a journey, and I am living out of my identity in Christ, not trying to achieve and and go towards it. Does that make sense at all? Yes, absolutely, and that is has been my experience as well. Is so, I, I and I talk a great deal about this in my book because it was really formational for me. I did not, as a child, develop a personal identity, and that was part of the problem. I I wasn't allowed to have a personal identity. I had to be who everyone around me said I had to be. And so I tied my identity to people, to everyone around me. And it's only been about five or six years ago, I was in a Bible study with um, Dr. Diane LeClaire, who's one of the premier theologians in the Church of the Nazarene. And she was talking about, you know, most of us were raised that pride is the root of all sin. And she would argue that idolatry is actually the root of all sin, either idolatry of self or idolatry of others. And and she was talking about, you know, with women especially, we're told, well, pride is the root of all sin. She's like, so many women suffer from such low self-esteem. They have no identity. They have no personal personhood. 
and you're telling them that pride. So they're looking for this pride that they supposedly have. And she's like, that, that's not usually where women struggle. Women, by and large, struggle with putting their identity in somebody else. So for me, my identity was completely found in my husband, in my children, in my grandchildren once I had them, in the church, in my pastors. I had to find an identity from all those people. And it was so when God started talking to me about that during that Bible study that Diane was leading, um, it wasn't a guilt sort of thing that, well, look at you, you've been having this idol. It was, no, this is what I needed and, and formed in, a, in order to survive my life. This is how I had to survive. But now it's time to let go of that and find my identity totally in God. And that was a scary thing to, to let go of all those and say, I can find my complete whole self in God. But the journey has been absolutely phenomenal. I, I am experiencing joy, true, incredible joy for the first time in my life the last few years. And it, it's, I didn't have access to that before. But to know that I, it's okay to be exactly who God created me to be. And that another thing that uh, Dr. LeClaire says is it, if you don't have a self, you don't have a self to give to God. So if you don't have an identity, how are you going to give something to God that you don't have? So once I started developing that identity, then I really had an identity and a person to give to God fully. And it's just, to me, the most beautiful, incredible thing to say, I'm okay. If something were to happen to my family and I was left all alone, I would survive. I would be okay in God. And this joy and peace that I have, it's been hard fought for, but it's so worth it. So worth it to, to secure our identity in, in God. Again, at the, at the risk of being dysregulating, um, and I, 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 I use the word dysregulating because there are some of those that out there that are triggered by the word trigger. So I won't, I won't use that now. Yes. <laughs> um, but you know, at the risk of being dysregulating, um, there, there are those that might listen to what you say and I've heard them and I've had, uh, some speak into my own life cause I share your, wow, my relationship with Christ is so amazing and better than it's ever mm-hmm. been in my life. And that's how it's supposed to be. Yes. But there are those who would say that, you know, if you if you had light at one time and now you've walked away from that <laughs> light, uh, you're obviously now living in sin because you're held to a higher standard because of that light. Um, and what you're experiencing is deception of the <laughs> the prince of darkness. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm like, as I'm saying these phrases, these, these aren't words, you know, that I'm making up. These are actual things that people say with a straight yes. face and believe with good intent um, Absolutely. and zealous fervor and righteous indignation that they are they're 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 helping you by saying these things. What mm-hmm. would you, what, what's your thoughts <laughs> to put you in the hot seat again? Um, what's your <laughs> thoughts on, on people that would say, even though you have all the fruits of the spirit, which is how we are to judge them by their fruit, there's mm-hmm. nothing added to the fruit that they are supposed to be, um, you know, showing, uh, even though they have all that, um, and they may be, you know, uh, and, and you said you're involved in your church and you're mm-hmm. ministering and you are reaching others for Christ. There are those that are saying you're still just, you're, you're, you're deceived and right. you're, you're obviously not in a right relationship. W- what are your thoughts on that? Cause that is, that is, that's hurtful from people that are so important mm-hmm. and have been such a big part yes. of our lives and are a part of the body that, of Christ. I will say that too. Yes. Yes. M- much of my family would be in that camp um, where they, they do not believe that I am a Christian. Um, and that has been really hard because it, they truly hurt for me. They truly have deep concern for me and my relationship with God, they are fearful that I'm going to go to hell. Absolutely. And so they, they speak out of that fear and that love for me, but it, it is hard 
to hear that. But one of the things, so I, sh I share the story that I shared earlier about when I was nine years old and I went to the altar. And one of the things, so about maybe two or three years ago, I was really, this was long after I was diagnosed with scrupulosity and had made a lot of progress, but I've still had some places I was stuck spiritually. And I was working with a woman who was helping me um, work through that. And we did a lot of praying together. And, and one of the things that God revealed to me very, very specifically, and I share the whole story in my book, but I won't take time to share that now. But God showed me very specifically when I, at that point, when I was nine, it was not God calling me to come to the altar. It was not God. I already belonged to him. But I was answering. So my light was not light from God. It was light from human beings. And I, because of the way I was raised, I took that light from human beings as being from God. And so God has been very gracious and very faithful to show me things that I do need to hold on to that are light from him, but also things that were not light from God and that it's okay to let go of those, but doing it very carefully and very mindful. And, and this, a number of years ago, I had a niece who was going through some of this sort, same sort of stuff. And she's like, do I just stop doing all the standards, all the rules, all that? I'm like, oh, oh no, no, no. Don't approach it like that. Don't change anything unless you feel clear with God on, on whether or not to change anything and take it very slowly. Don't just cast aside everything and say, well, I can do whatever I want because, you know, it's God's faithfulness, which is, you know, I, I hear those voices saying that, that would say, you know, well, you're just throwing everything off. Oh, no, no, no. You take it carefully and prayerfully and don't change anything because the, the Bible does say if it's not from faith, then it is sin. So acting from a, a place of faith. So an, a long, long time ago, long before I was diagnosed with scrupulosity, I actually had to stop using terms to describe my relationship with God, like salvation and sanctification and you know that were set a specific place in time you know people are like well what date were you saved what date were you sanctified <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like well which time and you know <laughs> which of the hundreds of times but to let go of all of those and just say i am living at this moment in complete obedience to god yeah, to the wow. best of what I know wow. and to the best of what the Holy Spirit is working in my life. And to just live with that openness mm. that I don't have to have, I don't have to put it, pin it down somewhere into a box. I can have the freedom in Christ to live each moment fully submitted and fully obedient to God. And so that gives me the confidence then when I meet with family and friends who who do think I don't, I don't have Christ. I don't try to convince them otherwise. I don't talk about, well, you know, this is, I can believe this, even though you don't, I, we don't go there. I just live my life trying to be as loving and as reflective of God's love and grace in my life as possible and, and leave it up to them. And, and I've had many family members that have come to, and, and it, in one sense, it's like, why does this matter? <laughs> but I am still human, you know, that, that I've had family that have, have come to believe in my relationship with God and, and say, yes, I, we see it. It's, it's there. It's reflected. And have, have even come to me just for spiritual kind of just talking wonderful spiritual stuff. But it's not through me trying to convince them or me even rejecting what they're saying. I, I just graciously say, I don't believe if they bring it up, I, I just say, I don't believe that's what God wants from me, but I am open to the Holy spirit in whatever way the Holy spirit wants to work in my life. Well, validation is 
is very much a, a wonderful thing to get, which, which is why I think yes. some people push so hard on others to even just get them to say, you know, do you think I'm going to help you or, or not? Um, just tell me and, mm-hmm. you, and you get back at, I can neither confirm nor deny, but I love you. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> well, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and you just have to kind of move on. Uh, but <laughs> well, it goes back to that idol of certainty, you know, with with scrupulosity, especially. I must know if I'm saved or not. I must know, and you and we say we absolutely can know. Well, some of us have lost the ability to receive assurance in that way, and that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing, you know when. It, well, I think it was Wesley that said, you can know that you know that you know sort of thing. And when mental illness makes you unable to receive that, that's a really hard thing. And so it, it makes us very vulnerable to trying to pin it down with assurance and with um, certainty, but to let go of all of that and just say, I trust God. I trust God regardless. And and I trust the Holy Spirit's presence in me to guide me. Yeah, and that and that's tough. Uh we've talked before on this podcast about coming to terms with, uh, because I don't know if you can necessarily be okay with being misunderstood. Um, yes. Especially by people. I mean, you're talking about family and a right. lot of a lot of what you grow up in and the people you look to for guidance and those that have helped form uh, your worldview, um, mm-hmm. and then at some point that switches to you're now the object of the condemnation. Um, right. Which which you know they're not going to say that to your face. They're going to be kind. Um, but you yes. know it come it comes through. Uh, we're we're human, and we understand <laughs> interactions. Um, right. I, I want, I want to go back to a thought and, oh my goodness, I'm looking up and we're almost at an hour. <laughs> um, uh, and we, we still need to talk about your book. Um, but I think we, we pretty much have, we've heard your heart. Yes. We've heard the heart of the author of, of you know, the book you've written here. Um, and you've alluded to, if, if you want to hear the whole story of this, that, or the other, you got to read the book. So it sounds like people just need to go get the book. <laughs> We'll tell you where yeah, to go get that. that'd be nice. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you where to go get that in a second. Um, and certainly while you're listening to the last few minutes here, go down to the show notes. we got a link down there uh, to where you can get uh, Deborah's book. Uh, so go ahead and be looking that up while you're listening and get that in your Amazon cart. Uh, or just click buy now. Just swipe over on that. Um, but as we're, as we're talking through this, this topic is, of, uh, and, and you mentioned it, you know, not having an identity or at least not forming one of your own. Mm-hmm. Um, there was an identity that you took on in a group, right. uh, you belonged, uh, you assimilated, you, you looked like, um, which sidebar on that all sounds like uh, means of survival rather than um, objects uh, 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 allowing you to flourish or, or, or ways to flourish. Yes. Um would you, uh, and understanding what codependency is, behavioral, emotional um, ways that individuals uh, have an unhealthy uh, compulsion to fulfill the needs of others? Uh, it, it can be in a, in a relationship with one or two people or in a, in a whole group, codependency. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on how maybe there's a codependence in some ways in the where you aren't able to form your identity because you're assimilating to the group and a codependency on the minister, a codependency on how others are uh, around you. What, what are your thoughts on that with uh, poor boundaries, people pleasing, uh, you know, dysfunctional communication we could put in there too. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, obsessions are in there as well. Right. Um, yes. What are your thoughts on how that may be a codependent atmosphere rather than one where people are able to live out their God-given identity uh, in Christ? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big question and an and a important one because it does foster codependency to, you know, I was not raised to think of each individual as developing totally who they are 
we we had to become whoever the church said we were or the the pastor said we were and so we we couldn't make decisions on our own or think through things on our own or and become who we were supposed to be i remember you know so i process everything through my intellect that's just that if you're familiar with strength finders um my my top three are intellection input and learner i do everything through my head well, i was raised in a family um, in some family dynamics that didn't and church dynamics that did not value that at all who are like you know you you think too much you overthink it's not right theology it's it's right relationship and um it so thinking was not a good thing well i am a natural thinker and so I didn't, I wasn't allowed to develop that strength until probably my mid forties when I started realizing, Hey, this is a strength. This isn't a foreign thing. It's good. I was, I was furious when I first took the, the strength finders test and found those for my top three, because I'm like, Oh no, I am a total failure as a Christian because I'm a thinker. And, but since developing my identity in, in God, the person that I am becoming is so uniquely me and so so uniquely a part of the body of Christ that, you know, I've come to think of it as each individual, as they fulfill who God made them to be and become who they were made to be, it enriches the body of Christ and just makes it bigger. What The, the metaphor that kind of comes to mind, so I have a friend uh, Penelope Wilcock, who has written some incredible, incredible novels. And in one of her novels, she it's titled Remember Me. She talks about communion. And she talks about how um, in in we say remember me. And that, you know, as as portions of the bodies of Christ, we're we're so disjointed, we're so broken, we're so whatever, but in communion we come back together and in a sense re- member which is the opposite of dismember we remember the body of christ and when we're all doing our unique thing as paul talks about that we're all different parts of the body and if you know it felt like we were all being molded just into a hand or a foot or whatever well you don't need 500 feet you need two feet you know and so when we aren't living out our full identity then that portion of the body of christ here on earth is missing we don't we can't bring to our church communities that portion of the body of christ that is uniquely us to to live out our gifts for each other and instead we we just become codependent and we become who we think everybody else wants us to be and it, it just, it's so stifling and ugly in a sense. And when you see the beauty of people being set free to be who God created them to be. So Dr. Diane LeClaire makes this statement about how we we kind of will dismiss things as, oh, yeah, that that's just human. And she's like, human, to become more human is to become more Christ-like because Christ was the perfect human. So the more like Christ we become, the more human we actually become. Human in the most positive as God created us to be sort of thing. And that's what I, I mean when I talk about as we find our identity in God, we become more human and more like Christ the perfect human. And um, that's been a really helpful thing for me to realize as well. Yeah. As, as we're talking here, I, and, and uh, yeah, we're coming, coming close to the end here, but I, I, <laughs> I know that this is sensitive for a lot of people, a lot of our listeners. And as, as I move through it and uh, you know, we're, we're we ex- I just want to make sure that, you know, I, and I hear this from you. I want to make sure that I'm navigating it in the way that Christ described himself the the best as gentle and lowly. Yes. Um, and in, in my interactions, you know, call out things where they are in a gentle, 
gracious uh, and a, a way that that shows that, you know, I don't think I'm better than anybody else. You know, I'm mm-hmm. I'm I'm here along with you. Um, and maybe I haven't come to a certain um, expectation that that one had of me. But, you know, I'm on a journey. So, yeah. Uh, before I ask for one more final thought from you, um, I do want to give you an opportunity to uh, tell people uh, where they can find your book and where they can find out more about you. All right. So my book is available on Amazon.com. Um, it's The Hijack Conscience. And the when I first started writing the book, I was writing specifically toward pastors because scrupulosity shows up in the pastor's office as a spiritual issue yeah, right, and rightfully so pastors too, yeah. who are, yeah, yeah. And, and not in a counselor's office, surprisingly, because you take your spiritual issues to your pastor and pastors who are not trained to recognize scrupulosity can actually do a lot of damage in their absolute efforts to help. Um, they can do a lot of damage. And so I, that has been my experience. And so I wanted to write this book for pastors. Well, then as I was writing it, I had some counselors come in with their inputs to say, hey, counselors need this too, because I've contacted some of my previous counselors and Christian counselors, never heard of scrupulosity ever. And so um, I just was at a conference with the National Alliance of Mental Illnesses, a faith net conference, and those counselors there had not heard of it, Mm. who were leading the conference. And so Um, it's for counselors, but it's also for those who suffer and for those family who walk alongside of them to learn what are the ways that you can help? Um, what are the ways you can avoid the pitfalls? Like assurance is a huge pitfall with scrupulosity. You don't give assurance to somebody with scrupulosity. So, um, yeah, that was the, the reason behind writing my book. And I use my own story as a backdrop to share and, uh, but yeah, it's available on Amazon. And we have that link in the show notes. So again, while you're listening here, if you haven't already, jump down there, click on that, check it out, um, get it in the mail so that you can start reading it uh, this week. Um, Before we go, I always like to give the the guest an opportunity to speak directly to the Grace Story community, those that are listening in. Um, If there's something that, uh, that, you know, you want to leave them with, um, a thought, an idea, something we talked about today or something that you've been thinking about recently um, from, from Deborah, what would that be? I think that would be just to know you are loved by God. You mentioned prevenient grace earlier. Prevenient grace to me is the most beautiful thing that says God is even more interested in you in your salvation than you are. He is not going to let go of you just because you don't understand things or you don't quite get it right. He loves you so much and will pursue you until there is no more time to pursue. And that is where prevenient grace comes in. So trust in the prevenient grace and love that God has for you that will hold you and guide you and, and won't let go of you. Um, he loves you more than any person loves you more than, and it's same for your relatives. Trust the Holy spirit is working in the lives of those who, who you might think of as lost. God is working in them as well. And his love will not let go of them. And that would be, my message. Yeah, that, I think it was, uh, it was Brennan Manning who said, um, God is uh, so enamored with his people mm-hmm. and so intent upon a response that he even provides the grace to respond. Exactly. Uh, my goodness. And it's beautiful. It is beautiful. <laughs> well, what a great note to end on. Um, Deborah, thank you so much for coming on Grace Story Podcast today and, and sharing your story. Um, I admire your vulnerability. Um, and thank you for, for everything you're doing through your book uh, to help others. Thank you for having me. And for you, the listener, thank you so much for listening in. If you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, give us a follow there. Tap a five-star rating and drop a review. If you're listening on Spotify, give us a follow there. Hit the notification bell to never miss an episode. 
Uh, we're always eager to hear from you, so feel free to email us with any suggestions, uh, your thoughts on what we've talked about today, or feedback. You can do that, Nate, at GraceStoryMinistries.com. There is no us without you. So get engaged, uh, continue on your journey of restoration. We'll see you in two weeks for another episode. And until then, we'll be praying for you.